Welcome everyone to this interview with the Office of the DARPA model for transformative technologies. This book is a remarkable collection of leading academic research on DARPA from a wide range of perspectives, combining to chart an important story from the agency's founding in the wake of Sputnik to the current attempts to adapt it and use it by other federal agencies. So today with us we have the authors of this volume. So first we have Richard Vanatta. Um, Richard Vanatta's career has focused on national security and technology policy, working for the Science and Technology Policy Institute, the Institute for Defense Analysis, and the Office of the U.S. Secretary of Defense. He has also taught in Georgetown University Security, security Studies Program. We also have with us Bill Van Billion. He's a lecturer at MIT, where he teaches science and technology policy, and a senior director for special projects at MIT's Open Learning Program. He has also written four other books and previously worked as a senior advisor in the U.S. Senate for over 15 years. And finally with us, we also have Pat Winham, who is a lecturer at the Public Policy Program at Stanford University and a partner in Technology Policy International, a consulting firm. He has previously worked for 13 years as a senior staff member for the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation. So thank you everyone for being today with us. Uh, so, my first question is for Dick Benatta. So, Dick, could you give us a DARPA in a nutshell? What is it? What is its history and how is it, how it is organized? Thank you, Laura. Well, DARPA is, in fact, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And those words themselves all have meaning in that it is an organization founded in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, as Laura mentioned, in response to Sputnik uh, and the the idea, at least at the time, that the U.S. was falling behind the Soviet Union in advanced technologies. This was particularly the case because the Russians had demonstrated a leadership in space that uh, we were found to be behind, and it was decided that there needed to be a new way of organizing technologies in order to uh, do uh, that leadership. So what we have here is a new mission. DARPA was actually founded to be a high risk, high payoff organization to pursue technologies that were not being pursued by others. By high risk, it meant that you were taking on technologies and issues that had not yet been explored and in fact were being underexplored by others. Uh, DARPA is in fact an organization that is unique and has remained unique pretty much as we will discuss now. It's unique in the sense that it is very small, very non-hierarchical, focused on bringing in individual program managers to pursue very advanced technologies and concepts. In fact, one of the very first programs that DARPA entertained was under a new program manager brought in from the Lawrence Laboratory, Nicholas Christophilus, who pursued a program called Argus, which exploded a nuclear weapon in space to see whether or not that could be a missile defense. That shows you the extreme of some of the notions and ideas that DARPA pursued. Now, DARPA has since then gone on for 60 years producing an, any number of advanced technologies, including stealth for, for weapons, advanced notions of precision strike for weapon systems, and in information technologies actually can be, uh, it can actually be attributed to the fact that it invented the internet. And, and in inventing the internet, it actually invented much more than that. One could actually say it helped create the discipline of computer science. So that is what DARPA has done, and over its years has transformed itself. One of the most important aspects of DARPA is, in fact, that it is constantly reinventing itself over new technologies, new organizational approaches, new research areas. And so as we'll talk about today, it is going into areas that are outstandingly different from anything anyone else is pursuing, including things such as, and controversial issues such as, human augmentation. So that is kind of a nutshell of what DARPA is and raises some questions of where it will go in the future. Well, thank you so much for this introduction. Uh, so my next question is for Bill Mambillion. So there have been attempt, um, attempts to create, in the US to create DARPA clones. Uh, so for example, all the DARPA like entities. So how has that worked? Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to chat with you today, Laura. Um, Replicating the DARPA model is, is not a simple process. Um, and there's a real question about how DARPA can be, can be replicated. And there are some DARPA clones in the U.S. that we can draw some lessons from. An early lesson of those DARPA clones is that 
the initial culture locks in and really determines what the agency will become, what the new entity might become. So DARPA had great early leadership, uh, you know, from people like Jack Ruina, JCR Licklider, Herb York, George Heilmeyer. Um, RPE, one of the clones of the United States, the Advanced Research Projects Energy, likewise had a remarkably talented founder and initial director, Arun Majumdar, who was later Under Secretary of Energy and now directs Stanford's Energy Initiative. But Arun and his initial team set up a very, very strong culture, uh, like DARPA, but also innovative in some additional ways. RPE was uh, the Energy DARPA, was founded in 2009, and a recent National Academy study in the U.S. validates this model and what it's accomplished. Another U.S. clone, the second successful DARPA clone, is IARPA, the Intelligence ARPA, that works for the, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence. You know, for example, over 70% of its projects move past their midpoints in technology transition uh, towards, an, towards an intelligence agency use. Um, the first director of IARPA was a longtime DARPA veteran, knew that model well and was able to institute it there. The U.S. has also had a problematic clone problem. Um, Homeland Security ARPA brought over when it was founded at the, at the beginning of this new department in the U.S., brought over 10 former DARPA program managers and a DARPA deputy director um, as well. So it had the talent and that understood what the model was be, but would be. But it was placed under a highly bureaucratic, much larger budget and policy office, it was never really allowed to make independent, independent decisions. So it faded, it was attempted to be revised, and has, has yet again faded. Um, so two successful attempts, one problematic one. Now, the UK, as well as Germany and Japan, have also considered DARPA kind of models and, are, and efforts are underway in those countries regarding this. Um, so hopefully the international models we can look at as well to see how transferable that model might be on an international basis. It's important to remember here that DARPA is not a standalone entity. It's very deeply linked to the U.S. Department of Defense. And DOD in the U.S. is concerned with implementing its technologies um, you know, not just having the research done. So DOD plays a very critical role in many cases, not all, in many cases of carrying those technologies through into implementation. Um, it's DARPA is a right-left model. DARPA will look at the right side of the innovation pipeline and decide what it wants, and then go back to the left side of the innovation pipeline to, you know, work on the R&D that will drive us to get there. Um, and that's not an easy task, but it wants an outcome. And most agencies in the U.S. use what's called a pipeline model. They do the research and dump that research into the innovation pipeline and hope something happens. DARPA has a different approach. It has this right-left approach to look at what it wants to get out of the pipeline, and then it can work with all the entities and powers and authorities that our Defense Department has to actually bring those technologies about. So it works in what we could call an extended pipeline. The Department of Defense will support the research and the development, and DARPA is an entity to do that. It will also support the prototyping. But then DOD will often help carry through on the demonstration, the testing, and through its procurement budgets, the actual initial market creation. So DARPA is not embedded in the Department of Defense. It's kind of an island bridge model. DARPA is on kind of a protected island away from the Pentagon, a few miles away. But it's able to build a bridge back, in effect, to the mainland to get its technologies carried out through the Defense Department. So as countries and, and agencies in the U.S. think about DARPA kind of models, um, They've got to think about what the implementation pathway is going to be. And if it's not going to be embedded in the Department of Defense that has procurement authority, then they've really got to think through how that's going to come up, how that implementation stage is going to occur. 
So ARPA-E in the United States, our energy DARPA, is in part of a major procurement agency like DOD. It's got to figure out ways to implement its own technologies. So ARPA-E had to create its own system for launching technology ideas that were coming out. It's interestingly used a series of approaches. Um, it has a tech-to-market team with commercialization experience that's on every research group helping to advise the, the grantees on how to implement that technology, how to get accepted by other companies, by venture, um, or, or by other federal agencies. Um, it works on in reach within the Department of Energy. In other words, it can connect its research up to other agencies that do a more applied work. Um, it creates kind of what we, what's known as a halo effect. Uh, RPE has is, is got a, a famously noted technology selection process. It's, it selects only the best and has a reputation for doing that. So venture capitalists and other firms know that if you've been picked by RPE, then you've got a halo. You deserve attention and potential support. And that has helped its projects get carried through. So these and some other steps have been used by RPE to try and carry forward its projects and if you're not going to be part of a large procurement agency, you really have to think through these additional strategies. Just a few supplemental rules for DARPA and its clones. DARPA and the clones in the U.S. that have worked have engaged in technology visioning. In other words, they form a vision of the technology that they want to get and then create a research pathway to get there, which includes implementation steps. As I said, they're off their island bridge. In other words, they're on a protected island away from bureaucracies, but they've got a route back to decision makers to move their technologies along. The DARPA agencies, like agencies, use great groups of innovators. They've got to find the very best teams uh, to carry out an innovation and reach a new technology. And they build thinking communities. In other words, it's not just the DARPA program manager, managers, it's a pretty, which is a pretty small group. It's the former program managers. It's the grantees, right? In other words, there's a much larger community that's accumulated over DARPA's over 60 years of history now. That's a real community that thinks about DARPA hard kinds of problems and helps bring them about. So those are some of the other approaches inherent in a DARPA type approach that organizations like ARPA-E and IARPA have been able to replicate. Well, thank you so much for that, Bill. So now continuing with Pat. Uh, so Pat, how can an ARPA fit into a nation's several science, technology and innovation system? And in particular, what can ARPA contribute and what does it need from other organizations in order to succeed? Thanks, Laura. Um, I'd like to make two points building on uh, what Dick and Bill have said. First, uh, an ARPA-type organization can fill a very important niche in a country's overall system for developing science and technology and applying it to innovation. The part of that that we know best is the creation of breakthrough technologies. As Bill said, ARPA has a vision of something that is really quite significant. Uh, it can be either building on a totally new technology or combining existing technologies to create a significant new um, capability. And uh, while universities, at least in the US, and I would argue probably the UK, uh, sometimes do uh, contribute real breakthrough technologies, biotech, whatever, ANARPA's particular strength is to create and demonstrate real working prototypes, often of, of what we call hard technologies, engineering, physical stuff. Uh, and that really is not a role that most other organizations are, are willing or able to play. So it fills an important niche. It also, uh, building on a point that Bill made, uh, has a second real benefit that um, is not always appreciated, which is in the process of, of funding these projects, uh, creating the teams, doing the work, DARPA has historically played an important role in creating what we call new technical communities, new interdisciplinary groups of people who understand the new technology because it's often been the performers and the program managers who've literally created a new field. And DARPA helps create, if you will, a cadre or group of people 
who understand that new technology and often can go on to help create products based on this or to train new students, et cetera. Um, I'll briefly mention some that, that were DARPA, not by itself, but with others has played an important role. In the 60s, early 70s, it helped create the interdisciplinary field of material science and engineering. Um, as, as Dick said, most famously um, created the field of computer networking. Um, much of the early work uh, done out here where I live in Silicon Valley uh, on personal computers was funded by DARPA, uh, done at, at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center. Uh, the computer mouse was invented uh, here uh, with DARPA money. Um, and so you can create a whole new set of experts who begin, including graduate students, begin to understand how to do things. And that's another important niche uh, that I think an ARPA can play. But my second main point in building what, what, what both Bill and Dick have said is, is to, to succeed, uh, an ARPA doesn't exist by itself. First, it has to have skilled people and new knowledge to draw upon. It needs the universities and government laboratories and corporate research labs, uh, both to provide new ideas and to provide people. DARPA's program managers don't come out of nowhere. They, they're drawn from these other institutions. And it, 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 if one is trying to consider, um, is considering a new ARPA, you have to ask, in my opinion, are there the foundational institutions, knowledge institutions, universities, government labs, and the people who can actually make this thing work. On the flip side, and this is building on Bill's point, um, a country will not get value, uh, benefits uh, from an ARPA unless there are organizations, government or private, that can pick up on those technologies and actually commercialize them, make real products, real services. Uh, DARPA itself helps by creating these technical communities. In, in the case of computer networking and personal computers, people went on to start companies like the early Ethernet companies and all sorts of things. But if there isn't, a, if you will, an innovation ecosystem, somebody to pick up on these technologies, then uh, a country is not going to get value out of its ARPA. They may work, it may work really well. It may produce some really interesting technologies and some skilled people. Um, but it won't create new economic benefit, new companies, et cetera, et cetera, unless there's that other part. So uh, we would argue that that while designing the ARPA and, and, and staffing it well and creating this island bridge model that Bill talks about is absolutely central. Also important is to understand what's needed from the rest of the ecosystem in order to truly make the ARPA successful. Well, thank you so much. So now going back to Dick Bernada. Uh, so Dick, uh, you have to picture DARPA as an innovation icon. So what have been the key features that you think have made it so? Well, we have emphasized and need to emphasize perhaps a little more our discussion here, the program managers and their actual independence from hierarchy and oversight. They're, they're not managed in the same way that most people in a company or other organization uh, would be managed. They are independent, but let's say, overseen with a gentle hand by an office director and the actual DARPA director. And that's the organization. There is not a massive number of other people in between, which differentiates DARPA from a lot of the National Science Foundation type programs and some of the foreign entities, even the attempt by Japan to stand up their own notion of a DARPA. And they embedded it in a massively hierarchical organization, which in fact pretty much defeated it. Uh, the program managers are in fact uh, very innovative, they're brought in based upon their ideas, their vision, as Bill mentioned, of where they can go, what new things can happen with this technology, but they're also hired for only a four-year period. They are not employees in the sense of being a career employees in an organization. They're temporary, and then know that after that period of time, they will leave, which means, in fact, they maintain a connectivity to the rest of the world because they know they're going to go somewhere. And they hope, obviously, to go someplace. So that raises an interesting question for the future, which is, in today's more competitive technology world with the Japanese, the Chinese, uh, the Europeans, all developing their alternative notions of advanced technologies, and these major corporations, many of which spun out of or were created under DARPA technology, such as Google and Amazon and the such, they are all competing with massive R&D technology developments uh, of their own 
which in fact call upon and perhaps even draw upon the same technology innovators that DARPA would like to draw upon themselves. So that raises an interesting concern there. We've mentioned that DARPA creates a community of what we call the community of change state advocates. In other words, these are fellow uh, travelers in a world of pursuit of high risk, even crazy technology developments. That, in fact, is important because you're inventing your own your own uh, uh, colleagues to go forward and build on the technologies that you have originally developed. Another element of DARPA is, in fact, that it maintains a close linkage to the application world, as Bill was pointing out. It is embedded within the DOD. It does, in fact, link to the DOD. It also has leadership in the OSD, Office of Secretary of Defense, which if that leadership sees a technology is, is not being pursued by the individual military services, they can use their leadership role in the Office of Secretary of Defense to find ways, we'll put it, of pursuing those technologies, either through uh, what might say some directive uh, type of approaches or velvet hands, if you will. Why are you not doing this? If you're not doing it, somebody else will. And that's how DARPA sometimes can get things done through the Office of Secretary of Defense to overcome military service recalcitrance because the military services have a huge embedded interest in existing technologies and existing approaches. DARPA's job is, in fact, to come up with alternative technologies that are, in fact, threatening to those. And so it will actually create problems for the military services that often uh, creates resistance. Finally, uh, DARPA basically has to deal with new advances in technologies, which requires it, in fact, to address problems that are perhaps even ethically of concern, and therefore it has to find ways of dealing with the overall technology community, but also a broader national science technology community in terms of where the technologies will go and how they might get there. That, I think, is a subject that we might pursue a little further in our discussions here today, but in fact also might be a discussion that we might engage in later with, uh, with you guys uh, in terms of what are the ethical issues of science and technology for the new technologies that are on the horizon, such as human augmentation, such as true artificial intelligence and artificially intelligent robotics, true biotech modification. Those are huge questions that today's DARPA is in fact pursuing in terms of technologies, and that raises some subsequent issues that I think we would like to get into as we go further. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so another question for you. So DARPA sees three shows some phenomenal successes and impacts. So are there some general features that underlie this? And if so, could you give some examples? Well, some of the key things we've talked about, such as the uh, DARPA's work in advanced computing, uh, show that one of the key features is the willingness to develop a broad technology image, a technology vision, and pursue it uh, across not just a single little technology, but pursue it across a broad spectrum of what does it take to invent the broader spectrum of the technologies. So Bill mentioned J.C.R. Licklider, who has been called the man who made computers personal. He had a technology vision of advanced computing that was totally different from anything that was being dealt with by anyone else. So you have a visionary. But the visionary also has to say, how do I develop the mechanisms and the individual capabilities of technology that are needed to make that vision work? And in this case, it wasn't just a particular doodad or a particular insta instantiation of an of a, of a individual technology. It was a breadth of technologies, such as how do you make uh, computers that can actually interact with humans? The old clunking, uh, clunker technologies of, uh, of the IBMs and the predecessors to that, the Univacs and all that, were not interactive. Second of all, how do you present things to humans that humans can understand better? That meant computer graphics, computer visioning, uh, which was extraordinarily important. And, and uh, uh, Pat mentioned Xerox PARC, uh, one of the key developers of new technologies for interaction with computers. So the mechanisms here were not just one individual technology, it was a breadth of technology. Another example of that 
is what we call the revolution in military affairs. DARPA, in fact, developed a set of technologies that were involved in precision strike. That precision strike technology was not a single individual technology, but a network of technologies, a actual system of systems of technologies. So in fact, DARPA perhaps even embedded the notion of systems of systems for military systems. And that, in fact, resulted in some prototype developments that were tested and laid out on how to connect the sensing and sensor technologies with the weapons technologies and be able to then control those technologies and disperse them over two or three thousand miles to get from the from the where the weapons were to the targets and then disperse those weapons individually precisely on individual targets that was a huge concept uh, that then resulted in basically what in the end we called the revolution of military affairs and when bill perry and uh, his secretary, Harold Brown, uh, were in the Pentagon. They, in fact, invented the term a revolution of military affairs, and they called it the uh, precision strike technologies. Huge differences. Well, what was the key element of that? The willingness to take on a broad vision aimed at a huge problem. The problem was that the Soviet Union could attack U.S. forces with nuclear weapons in Europe before we could respond to that. So it was the big issue. And the problem that turned to over was we can't just rely upon nuclear weapons to provide our defense of Europe. Come up with something different. And so that goes back to Bill's point about this is an end state issue. This is a goal and objectives. Here is something nearly impossible that you need to think about. How do we come up with something that will address that kind of a problem? So that is the kind of fundamentals. And it goes to a couple of things we mentioned, which is DARPA's ability to take on any problem, the willingness to take on any problem. If it's too hard, it's, it's something that DARPA needs to do. DARPA can take on those kind of problems. Second of all, it can go out and get the resources from wherever. It doesn't depend on a particular laboratory. It doesn't depend upon the existing structure of individuals who exist in one place or another. It almost invents the technologies and then invents the people to pursue the technologies and invites them to come help solve this impossible problem. So it's that sense of almost technological and uh, applications adventure that entices people to come to DARPA and work with DARPA. Well, thank you so much. And uh, final question, uh, are there some developments or factors that you think would make it more difficult for DARPA to succeed today? Well, I think I mentioned this already a little bit, and that is DARPA started off in a world where nothing like it existed. And in fact, the technological capabilities of all the countries, uh, including the U.S., were embedded in relatively isolated research laboratories, both in companies such as IBM and General Motors, uh, and in governmental laboratories, including the U.S. government R&D laboratories uh, and our national laboratories. But also, if you think of the individual countries such as the Soviet Union and the U.K., they all had their R&D labs locked up and kind of individually. Uh, uh, working on problems with a set of institutional scientists, if you will. Uh, today, that's a very different world. Today, we have massive R&D efforts going on in the Googles of this world, if you will, the Amazons of this world, the, the, the Samsungs of this world. Samsung has a phenomenal R&D technology laboratory system, which, in fact, they are emulating DARPA in some of their organizational work. Uh, and also we have, of course, China and, and, and Russia. So this creates a different world. Everyone has emulated DARPA. And the other thing they do is they, they watch DARPA. There's no question if you look at the intelligence information, uh, DARPA is constantly being watched and observed and copied in terms of not just the organization, which is hard for them to do, but more importantly, as soon as DARPA comes up with an idea or puts, uh, gets people R&D, doing the R&D in certain areas, they immediately emulate that, copy it, and try to, in fact, steal it. So DARPA has a problem today in that there's much more going on than in 1958 and the 1960s in others doing very rapidly uh, what DARPA is also doing. The other thing, as I mentioned, is the people problem. Uh, DARPA has a people problem, even though sometimes they try to 
try to say they don't. And that, that, that people problem is, in fact, the enticement of people to go to work for big buck companies. They can make a lot of money doing the same thing that they perhaps could do at DARPA. Now, the question that is raised, of course, is can they be as independent? And can the problems they take on be as significant if you're at a company uh, compared to whether you're at a DARPA? Added to that, of course, is the foreign entities who want to chase after DARPA, they put a lot of money into scientists and, and ideas to try to get those same ideas too. So those are key challenges that DARPA faces today. Adding to that, of course, is the question of some of the ethical underlyings to what DARPA is pursuing today. In fact, what all the world advanced technology is pursuing today, raising the questions of who monitors or oversees or has insights or oversights about how far do we pursue these? Well, thank you so much for that, Dick. So now we're moving on to Bill Vermillion. So, Bill, um, DARPA is somewhat and unique in our organization that takes advantage of the Defense Department that is located within. So given this, can the DARPA model be replicated? Well, the answer, I think, Laura, is, is that it can, but it's going to have to be a different kind of organization if it's not going to be embedded in a large procurement agency like the Defense Department. And I should say, too, um, and Dick and Pat went over some of this history, but the IT revolution that, that DARPA played a very, very significant role in, um, certainly in personal computing and the Internet, um, that was stood up not in the defense sector. <laughs> primarily, right? That was stood up primarily in, you know, the civilian economy, we can call it. Um, and DARPA very consciously did so. It, it saw that these technologies were going to uh, advance further and faster if they became uh, part of a market economy rather than a defense economy. Uh, and a market economy can put far more resources on incremental improvements and advances uh, than typically a defense department or a procurement agency can. So they were consciously stood up in the civilian sector. Um, and in turn, the defense department, you know, leveraged off them as they evolved. Obviously, the, the personal computing and internet opportunities that got created in the civilian side became opportunities in effect, dual use opportunities for uh, for the defense side as well. So DARPA has been able to do both. It's been able to innovate in the civilian economy as well as in what we could call the defense economy. Um, but I think, you know, an important point here is that ARPA-E may be a better model for regions or countries or other agencies in the U.S. to consider than a straight DARPA model. Uh, if you're not going to stand up your new ARPA in a, in a large procurement agency that has the ability to buy the technologies that you're going to create. The kinds of creative things that RPE has done, uh, you know, I think become paramount. Uh, I mentioned tech to market. I mentioned in reach within DOE to use applied agencies. I mentioned the halo effect. You know, another key point is that at the outset, RPE will not proceed with a technology project unless there is a clear pathway to potential commercialization, right? How could that technology actually get into the marketplace? And if there's no real way it can, if it's going to cost too much, if it's going to take too long, it's not going to pursue, RPE will not pursue that technology. Um, so, you know, these are all ways in which a, uh, an ARPA-like entity could, uh, could pursue introductions of technologies. Well, thank you so much. So following on what you said about ARPA, um, so do you know if it has been able to launch any major technologies yet? Um, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. It's about 10 years old now. Uh, the Nas a recent National Academy study has validated the model and indicate many technology advances that are now pending and evolving in energy that RP has helped to contribute to. You know, RPE is not the IT sector, right? Energy technologies take much longer to evolve. It's not a, it's not software, right? It's not a three to five year effort or even less to stand up your software mo model. These are hard technologies and they take 10, 12, 15 years to scale up. Um, if then, and it's a difficult process and requires major capitalization. 
in order to undertake them. So it's going to be a slower process in energy. But let me, let me remind everybody that technology implementation is not fast anyway, right? So, you know, our DARPA was created in 1958. Um, JCR Licklider arrives there in, in 1960, um, begins to embark on this group of technologies that are going to lead to the IT revolution, um, has a vision for what, you know, the internet could be from 1960 onward. We don't get the internet until 1969, right? And then nobody knows what the internet is until about 1990, right? So even technologies that move very quickly take a long time to establish. So when you set up one of these ARPA things, you really have to be patient and, and keep a careful eye on what the advances are uh, because it's going to be a long time, inevitably, before implementation occurs. Well, thank you so much for that, Bill. So my next question is for Pat Windham. So, Pat, I understand that DARPA research played a role in supporting the technology of two of the leading, the leading coronavirus vaccine candidates. So could you tell us this story a bit about it? I can tell a bit. Uh, I'm not a biologist, so I will get some of the details um, a little fuzzy. But it's actually it's, it's a remarkable story. Uh, in 2010, a new program manager came into DARPA, an Air Force doctor named Dan Wattenberg, Wattendorf, excuse me. And he had a vision, which his bosses agreed to. His vision was that, um, and, and he didn't know how to do it, but he had a vision of being able to rapidly develop um, new vaccines in 60 days and also related new antibody treatments, which can help. They're not vaccines, but they can help deal, prevent, and, 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 and help treat uh, people with the virus. Um, and he wanted to do all this in 60 days. He also wanted to use techniques that could lead to rapid manufacture, rapid production of vaccines and antibodies. Because as you may know, most vaccines today require something like eggs and cultivation. It's, it's a very long, hard, expensive process. Uh, people thought he was crazy not at DARPA, but elsewhere. Um, his, his approach was to use what's called messenger RNA. I don't really understand this, but instead of creating a, a vaccine, for example, he said, let's rapidly create a, 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 a basically a version of the bug and then let the human body, after you inject it, create its own vaccine, in effect. Um, so he's got permission to do this. They put out some requests for proposals. A lot of people in the community said, it's crazy. And then what happens frequently in a DARPA program is that some of the people that DARPA was talking to about actually doing this research said, well, wait a minute, how far could we get? And what would it take? And you begin to, to, to build what, what Dick was calling these, this change state community. These are people who say, well, maybe we could actually do this. And then they start working on it. One of the companies and DARPA can fund startup companies, big companies, government labs, universities. As, as, as Dick said, there's no central laboratory DARPA has to go to. They go whoever's best. They put together teams of people across institutions. One of the companies uh, was a new startup called Moderna in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And today, Moderna, using this is for vaccines, using this new messenger RNA technique, which everybody admits has never produced a vaccine yet is the first American company in phase three clinical trials, the, the third big stage before our Food and Drug Administration has enough data to decide whether to license it or not. Um, they're the first ones going. So is the second company. And um, again, these are unproven. DARPA is also, as I said, funded work on antibody treatments. And there's some American companies working on this. Um, and uh, it's an international effort. The startup companies don't have the production facilities to do this. So they're working with both large pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. and large companies in Europe. But it's an interesting story about how one brilliant visionary guy said, I think we can do this. And then his superiors, the, off the office director and the agency director at the time, um, are rigorous trained people themselves technically and scientifically and they put they put the DARPA program manager through the ringer 
Okay, you really have to, to tell us that there's a chance of doing this. Is your science good? Have you talked to the best people in the community? DARPA doesn't just sort of throw money out and say, oh, go try this. They, they really expect their program managers to have a realistic plan, but for doing something daring. And that's what happened here. Uh, I should mention, by the way, some people ask, why is DARPA doing biology? Well, Wattendorf was an Air Force doctor. And he looked at the number of American and allied personnel being sent all over the world in the post 9-11 world, um, including places where there were viruses, Ebola, chikungunya, others, and said, you know, our military personnel are at threat. And if a new virus comes up and suddenly is threatening um, American and allied soldiers, we really want to get a treatment fast. Uh, at least a treatment, and if we can, a vaccine. So there was a compelling military reason to do this. But as Bill said, many of these technologies are what we call dual use. They have both potential military value and potential commercial value. And so it turns out right now the biggest application of these new vaccine and antibody uh, development technologies are being applied to COVID. And um, we hope they succeed. It's still unproven. So we'll see. But it's, it was a daring plan and an example of what DARPA can do when it tries to go big. Well, thank you so much. That was indeed a fascinating story. Uh, so you, you noted, and it's been noted throughout the conversation, how the art model requires technical communities. So could you tell us more about what is meant by this? Well, I'll build a little bit on what both Dick and Bill have said. Um, what, DARPA will contract with a group of people, right, different teams. Frequently, um, they will fund multiple people in, in, in a single program who have somewhat competing ideas. Um, it's a sort of portfolio approach. But then they'll bring those people together once a year, twice a year. And as part of the DARPA community, and it's part of the contract, those people basically share what's working and what's not. Okay, And a DARPA program manager, interestingly enough, plays a, a, a remarkable dual role once a program started. She is there to basically, if you will, hold the uh, researchers' feet to the fire. I mean, we want milestones, we want progress. But it's also, by nature, an unpredictable business. And so good program managers will say to the performers, R&D performers as we call them, the, the researchers, uh, tell, us, tell me your problems. And I'll work with you because nobody expects this to go perfectly. So the program manager becomes a kind of coach, maybe a mentor, but, but part of a team player. In the process, both individual teams and then groups of teams who come together begin to be sort of a joint problem solving community and frequently interdisciplinary. Okay. They're trying to do something new and they're trying to build a real prototype, not just write research papers for nature or science. Out of that uh, comes a group of problem-solving people who have actually got probably the best knowledge in the world about that particular new technical capability, which is rough, right? It's a, but they can do demonstrations. So famously in the case of, of computers and computer networking, uh, they arranged demonstrations of two in particular, one out here in Silicon Valley of, of personal computing, which was done by the guy who invented the computer mouse, but he also integrated stuff, did a big demonstration, brought together not only the people who were doing the work, but then brought in sort of allied people, educated them, showed them this was possible. And a similar one some years later on computer networking in the early days of the ARPANET. So you begin to get a group of people who not only understand the technology, but say, hey, you know, we could do something with this. And then they go off, uh, in some cases, and either start companies or work for big companies or, you know, work in the defense community and actually start to do this. DARPA also has helped, if I may just wrap this up, um, with other parts of what you might call community building. So, for example, in the university community for material science, later computer networking, they would, uh, DARPA would help uh, sometimes financially, but certainly through encouragement, uh, to start new academic journals. And before long, it became, you know, something like material science and engineering became recognized as a new field. So universities began to create departments of this. They began to create departments of computer science. There was no computer science before Licklider. 
There were people who built big computers, uh, usually with Defense Department funding, but there wasn't a discipline. And so before long, you get computer science as a department of materials. We now have what's called biological engineering. And many agencies have played a role of that worldwide. But DARPA's played a big role in this. And sometimes you talk about synthetic biology, whatever. But it's the ability to actually design biological products. Um, so these are not initiatives just by DARPA, but by funding these interdisciplinary teams, letting them develop knowledge, letting them establish a community identity and, and, and validate what they're doing with the larger world. Um, DARPA's played a really important role in creating not just technology, but groups of people who understand and can use those technologies. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, so my last question, Pat, is how far the innovation, um, and how far down the innovation pipeline does DARPA take its project? So as you mentioned, like things like prototype, and so how does it do this, and how does it like move technologies to later stages? Well, I'll, I'll, I want to let Dick talk about this as well as I may afterwards, because he's actually worked in in the Defense Department. But but um, let me mention as a background point: sometimes when DARPA is developing a new technology, the military services are interested in it. But as Bill said, frequently they're not. Um, militaries, by definition, have to be conservative. That is, they have to use proven technologies. They have to. You know, they don't want wild experiments about things that may not work on the battlefield and get people hurt. Um, sometimes they're interested, sometimes not. Um, and DARPA sometimes will operate uh, independent of the services, that island part Bill mentioned, and they will push a technology they think is worthwhile. What they do that's most useful is they demonstrate it works. Okay. I'll give you an example. Um, Autonomous ships, again, a controversial subject, but autonomous here means a ship that actually is a robot. It's not remotely controlled like some of our um, un un uncrewed uh, aerial vehicles. An actual ship that just navigates 12,000 miles on its own. And DARPA had this view that this, this was a technology that might be useful. There were people in the Office Secretary of Defense interested. The Navy hated it because they thought, well, we don't want that and it won't work. An autonomous ship will still crash with others. DARPA kept working on it. They, the Navy began to say, well, maybe it's kind of worth a look. And then by the time uh, they actually built one and, and christened it in Portland, Oregon, uh, the Navy was, was on board. Okay, so in that case, the Navy's willing now to take it the next step. And in fact, the latest vision for the U.S. Navy just released in the last couple of weeks by the current Secretary of Defense, envisions a future naval force of both crewed and, and autonomous ships. I mean, many of them. Um, sometimes the services will ask DARPA to go beyond the prototype stage. Help us rapidly commercialize this. You've worked with defense companies. This is usually with prototype weapons, right? Not computers, something like that. You've worked with the, with the companies that built the prototype weapon. Um, help us go to the next stage. An example of that is a new Navy anti-ship missile called Lorazm. Uh, this is public. This was the only reason I know about it. But DARPA helped develop this um, using existing technologies, but, but quite new capability. And the Navy became convinced this is really valuable and actually asked DARPA to, to go ahead and help them work with the defense contractors on that. But usually what DARPA will do is create the, the working prototype, demonstrate that it works, at least in, in a basic way, and then hope the services will take over. And they're there to provide advice if, if they want it, um, but usually they then hand it off. And that's that whole issue of technology transition is actually a huge topic. It's problematical sometimes for, for DARPA. And as Bill said, in the commercial world for an ARPA -E or other organization, uh, one should pay a lot of attention to how you think companies and, and government labs will pick up on something. It's not automatic. And so the role of the ARPA may get more into actual early production than, than one might first think. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much um, to everyone. Uh, so I'm just going to go around uh, quickly to see if you have any uh, brief closing points that you would like to share with us. So I'll start with Dick. Did you have any 
Case in point, you will have to enlighten me. Well, it, we've, we've raised all kinds of important aspects of DARPA and what DARPA is. I think it's, first of all, important that we summarize with uh, some of the key elements. First of all, uh, DARPA is a funding agency. It doesn't have its own laboratories. It doesn't have a structure of scientists and technologists who just do their thing. And uh, DARPA just gives other people money. Now, it does it in a very, very deliberative way, very, very careful way, uh, with lots of uh, individual oversight by the program manager. It's not just throwing money uh, out the back of the truck. It, giving the money to the guy and saying, okay, how are you going to do this? What are you going to show me that you can do? Why is it important we do it this way, et cetera? And there's a set of criteria we have in our book uh, several different times. In fact, the Heilmeyer criteria, named after George Heilmeyer, the uh, one of the former directors of DARPA, uh, on the oversight that you ask in terms of the tough questions before you get the money, while you have the money, and in fact, they become the criteria if, to kill programs. And that's a very important thing we quite haven't focused on, and that is DARPA managers don't just give you the money and then let you go. If you're not making progress, that's money they want to put somewhere else. So if you're not showing that you're making your milestones and developing things and showing promise, they'll cut your project right there and then. An example of that was uh, a, a system for uh, a, a, a internet distributed satellite system that was initially a project that was envisioned to be a way of putting satellites up that would be more robust in that sense that they wouldn't just be a giant ball in the space, but they would be a, a distributed network of little satellites that would perform the function of a large satellite. Uh, and that also would be cheaper to put up because it would be the individual pieces that then would be netted together. It was a great idea, an adventuresome idea. Another example of a crazy idea, if you will. But the only problem was, after about a year or so of, inter of using uh, Orbital Sciences and a couple other companies, they weren't getting there. So they just cut the project and said, let's go with internet companies who know how to net things together, and anybody can put the balls up, if you will. Well, they, that didn't work after six or eight months or a year. They just canceled the whole project. And that led to money then going into alternative ways of making robust satellites, et cetera, that DARPA has pursued since. So DARPA has a tough love kind of environment. You, you're wonderful people. You're doing great stuff, but you're not showing progress. Well, okay, uh, this is canceled. Come back with a better idea or an alternative idea later. The other thing we wanted to emphasize and we have emphasized is that it's a lean organization. It is not a bureaucracy. It's not a hierarchy. And that's very important because that means there are fewer and fewer people who can say no and get in the way, but there's one person who can say no and stop things right away if he thinks it's dumb, and that's the DARPA director. And there have been DARPA directors who said, you know, I should not have shut that one down. I did it too soon. But then again, this is important money. I need to make sure that it's well spent on things that make sense. The other thing we mentioned was the program managers, their autonomy, their individualism, their adventurism. We need people like that. And I'll make a point, which is that most countries don't allow such people, don't enable such people to have a venue to, to succeed. The, I mentioned the Japanese, I mentioned the Koreans. Uh, there are certain societies that are very structural, hierarchical, and are based upon if you will, consensus, consensus orientation, and, and that's really true in many of the science worlds. Finding people who can go out the way the program managers do is crucial. And in fact, when we were talking to some people, uh, Bill and Pat and I, in Japan about their notion of a DARPA, we presented them this notion of the independent uh, gunslinger, if you will, a program manager. One of the young Japanese uh, science technology guys came up to me and said, oh, no, we could never do that here. Just an example. I was in India uh, talking about these ideas. Very much the same concern. Oh, we can't do that here. So until you break that notion of allowing people to have that level of independence and it, take on the responsibility, the individual responsibility for that program, not have someone else to blame, not have an organization to blame, if you will, if, if you don't succeed, and by the way, not succeeding in DARPA isn't a bad isn't a bad thing. You're not punished for not succeeding. You're congratulated for trying to take something on. You did a great job. Too bad it didn't work out. In fact, the program manager who did that uh, space uh, program, the Super Space Program, was given another program on advanced manufacturing, uh, which he took on subsequently. 
So that's crucially important. And Pat mentioned the portfolio approach. DARPA doesn't just fund one organization or one person. In fact, they award multiple projects, some based on a little seedling ideas, some on a broader concept, and they are, in fact, competing with each other. And they are then told they have to interact with each other. So DARPA puts people in awkward positions. You have great ideas. They have great ideas. Oh, you want to keep your secret? Too bad. You have to tell the other guys how you're going to do that because this is, in fact, for a broader, bigger cause. So those are the kind of things that make DARPA different and make DARPA really a crucially important organization. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, so I'm continuing with Bill. Do you have any codes and comments that you would like to share? Sure. Let me just reiterate, I think, some key points about the, about the DARPA model itself uh, that need to be kept in, kept in mind. Um, you know, an important point that, that both, that Pat particularly has been making is that there's a real need to link the technicians, the technical people to the operators. And otherwise, you don't really know what you've got, right? And the operators are the ones that can tear it down and experiment with it and try it and see what works and what doesn't work. And typically in DARPA projects, as they go through that prototyping phase, um, there will be close ties to potential operators that can really help inform and help the, the DARPA technical people understand, you know, what they what they develop. So linking the technologists to the operators, I think, is a key point. We talked a good bit about technology visioning. Industry doesn't do technology visioning. Industry does innovation by stage gating. In other words, they will establish a series of thresholds. And if the particular product that's in the evolutionary phase doesn't look like it's going to be highly profitable or available anytime soon, out it goes. DARPA works differently. It works with a technology vision and then moves to get there. And RPE and IARPA have the, have the same approaches. Island Bridge, we've talked about. It's very important to protect the innovators and, you know, in, from the bureaucracy, but it's also absolutely critical to get that bridge back to the mainland, back to the decision makers. So, you know, as Dick was talking about, you know, the role in getting DARPA technologies stood up, and Pat was discussing it as well, DARPA's ability to appeal to the Secretary of Defense or senior people within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, that's absolutely critical because the technology adopters, the military services, may not necessarily want it. And that decision-maker ability to move a technology out is key. Um, finding great groups of innovators, that's absolutely essential. So DARPA's ability to just seek them and put them together from many, many different sources and then bring their thinking together uh, as, as groups of innovators, that's really a critical capability. And we discussed, too, the need to build these technical communities, these thinking communities that can think together over an, often over an extended period of time in putting these new technologies together. I think that's another key underlying DARPA rule. Well, thank you so much, Bill. And finally, Pat, do you have some closing comments? You well, I'll just reiterate, uh, I think, two points that we've been talking about. One is this, this has been a remarkably successful model. And, and um, as Dick said, it's also identified dead ends. I mean, that's part of its learning process. DARPA is, is, is a remarkable learning machine and community. All right. That's its job to try things uh, with bold visions, deliberate thought, um, but learn. These are experiments, if you will. They're calculated, risky experiments, but they're not dumb. They're, they're, they're quite thought out, and it has led to some remarkable actual achievements. It is perhaps our premier organization in the U.S. for what we sometimes call solution-based R&D, actually having a goal and trying to, to reach it. And then we'll see whether these things either succeed or, 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 or not. Um, the second point is um, I think the DARPA experience and now ARPA, E, I, ARPA, at least in the U.S., give us a lot of information about what it takes to make this kind of organization work. And, of course, that's what we've been talking about today, Bill. And Dick just gave, I think, a very good summary of what the agency does and how it works. So there is a great deal of knowledge about how to make one of these things work. But at the same time, it really uh, is, is an object lesson in having to think through the details of both 
the, the design and operation of the organization, including the autonomy of the program managers, and the larger ecosystem. This is not something that's easy to do. But there is a base of knowledge that, that all of us can, can now draw upon if we want to design new ARPAs. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much. And we have had with us um, today, so Richard, Manasseh, Bill, Von Lillian, and Patrick Winden. Uh, so just for everyone who's watching, this book is freely available to read and download um, in www.openbookpublishers.com. Thank you so much to everyone again for this um, nice interview. Thank you. <laughs>